Hello, I'm Bruce Schumann. I am professor and chair of marketing at Virginia Commonwealth University. And today we're going to talk about corporate reputation, ethics, and marketing. Our objective today is to build on your knowledge of ethical conduct and methods of ethical decision-making in implying an ethical decision-making lens to marketing communication and promotion decisions. So how does the daily practice of acting ethically affect a business or organization's reputation? Well, every choice, even an unconscious choice or a choice to do nothing, has implications for the organization and its stakeholders. And every choice is going to be evaluated by others as the right or wrong thing to do. So learning about business ethics is going Going to help you to make better decisions. So what's an example of a day-to-day -day ethical issue? Well, let's look at the Albuquerque Parks Department. The Albuquerque Parks Department tracks its vehicles and knows where its employees are at all times. When the Albuquerque Parks Department first started this program, it notified employees that it was going to put tracking devices on all the vehicles and start tracking the vehicles in use. The first week it did so, it found one of its trucks spent a long time at one of the casinos outside of town. And the employee driving the truck was fired because he wasn't spending time doing park business, but was spending time gambling instead. Also, many employers track people's cell phones. Now, legally, employers in most jurisdictions in the United States have the right to use tracking technology to monitor their employees on the job. This includes their employees' use of workplace computers, phones, equipment, and vehicles, as well as their employees' location and behavior. Tracking people outside of work, such as on their private cell phone, that's much more questionable, both legally and ethically, because any tracking there may be seen by those who are being monitored as an invasion of privacy. If your organization does gather such information, that organization has a responsibility to keep this tracking data confidential to maintain trust. Now, what's the difference between privacy and confidentiality? Well, privacy is someone's ability to control the extent, timing, and circumstances of sharing information about themselves with others. This includes physical, behavioral, and intellectual information about oneself. Confidentiality relates to the treatment of information that an individual has already disclosed in a relationship of trust with the expectation that it will not be divulged to others without permission, in, at least not in ways that are inconsistent with what that individual understood to be the purpose of their original disclosure. So although privacy and confidentiality are closely related, they're not identical. Again, privacy relates to information and how it's gathered, whereas confidentiality refers to the obligations of people and organizations to appropriately protect the information that has been disclosed to them. Laws also limit information disclosure and the need to maintain confidentiality in certain circumstances or over certain types of information. For example, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, protects the disclosure of educational records. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, protects the dissemination of private health information. Lord Francis Jeffrey, a Scottish judge and literary critic, said a good name like goodwill is got by many actions and lost by one. More recently, Warren Buffett similarly remarked, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. An ethical reputation can enhance the market value of a corporation because what investors are willing to pay to own stock in a corporation goes beyond its current position to include future expectations and goodwill. And goodwill is partly based on reputation. Even if certain stakeholders, such as shareholders, want management to bargain aggressively with other stakeholders like customers, suppliers, and employees, each stakeholder group's perception of the corporation's reputation is affected by whether or not those stakeholders believe that they are being treated fairly and ethically. The reputation of a company or its brands can also be affected by its marketing communication and the ethical or unethical nature of its marketing communication. Marketing communication includes includes things like advertising, sponsorship, product placement, and promotion. If people know that there are certain lines that you're not going to cross, you build trust. You also build brand value because customers know that they can rely on your brand. And you build goodwill because strategic partners and investors know that they can count on you. Now let's look at an example of unethical sales practices at Wells Fargo and ask ourselves, how did these unethical sales practices affect Wells Fargo's reputation among consumers? As well as, was it quick or easy for Wells Fargo to regain their reputation and reestablish trust with consumers? And what the likely impact impact on their business and its profitability over the next few years has been. 
So this slide shows values from Wells Fargo's website. And these are admirable values, but leaders must model. They must live these good values, these good ethics, or employees are going to think that this is all talk and not really important. Following the financial crisis in 2007 and the Great Recession, Wells Fargo emerged as one of the banks with the best reputation. And it built on this reputation by becoming involved in local communities in which it operated and supporting local initiatives. This reputation helped them double the number of branches from little over 3,000 in 2007 to more than 6,000 in 2010. Although branch growth leveled off after about 2010, the number of customer accounts continued to grow. Wells Fargo account growth helped the stock to double in value between 2011 and 2015. But leaders at Wells Fargo kept pushing for more growth, and they set up incentives to push employees to make that growth happen. And then the news broke about the corners Wells Fargo was cutting to make that growth occur. In September 2016, Wells Fargo fired some 5,300 employees, about 1% of its total work workforce for signing up customers for checking accounts and credit cards without those customers' knowledge and approval. Authorities said that about 2 million sham accounts were open going back as far as 2011, complete with forged signatures, phony email addresses, and fake PIN numbers, all created by employees who were hounded by supervisors to meet their daily account quotas. The bank then charged customers at least $1.5 million in fees for these bogus accounts that they didn't even know they had. Now, the problem is is not just the fees that these customers were charged for these phony accounts, because the credit scores of many of these customers were harmed because they did not stay current on accounts that they didn't even know they had. And in the following years, these customers have been having difficulty securing home loans and car loans at reasonable rates because Wells Fargo defrauded them. That's patently unfair. Now, why did this happen? Well, at the core, there's a marketing ethics issue. Wells Fargo set up incentives for their account sales force to encourage aggressive cross-selling. These salespeople were encouraged to sign customers up for multiple bank services. So if somebody had a savings account, they would be pressed to also open a checking account, get a credit card, or maybe even a loan. Employees who miss the sales quotas would have to work weekends or stay late. So is it a surprise that some employees made their quotas by faking a few accounts some weeks to avoid these negative consequences? The $185 million fine levied against Wells Fargo is only a small percentage of what it likely earned from its sales tactics. Over the past 13 years, the bank increased the average number of products per customer from four to six. At a bank with 70 million customers, that translates into tens of billions of dollars. Now, the low-level employees were fired. The CEO, I have to say, did the honorable thing and took responsibility and quit. But many other executives and investors have likely profited without any repercussions. With Wells Fargo's reputation damaged, customers began to switch away from them. A year later, in 2017, account growth had slowed and almost one in five Wells Fargo branches were losing deposits. The damage continued for several more years. In 2018, Wells Fargo cut 26,000 jobs and closed or sold more branches, including all 52 of its branches in Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. In 2019, its CEO Tim Sloan resigned because of an account fraud scandal. Later in 2019, Wells Fargo sold its institutional retirement and trust business. And in 2020, the company was forced to sell its student loan portfolio. In 2021, Wells Fargo had to sell its asset management division and a Canadian finance division. Also in 2021, Wells Fargo laid off another 6,400 employees and closed another 250 branches. Wells Fargo now has only 5,039 branches, down from around 6,600 before this scandal. As you can see, Wells Fargo has had a lot of trouble continuing to grow a business and in fact has had to sell off and close many parts of its business just to stay afloat after this scandal. Now, Wells Fargo is a big ethical crisis. But smaller decisions also have ethical implications. Marianne Jennings has identified seven signs of ethical collapse. And when you see these, there's often something wrong at the company. The first one is a pressure to maintain numbers. And we saw this at Wells Fargo with the pressure for its employees to keep adding a certain daily quota of new accounts. The second one is a fear of speaking up. The third one is a superstar CEO who surrounds themselves with inexperienced folk who want to climb faster. These CEOs know these people will not dissent and therefore will be yes men and support them in anything that they want to say or do. Number four is a weak board of directors. 
Number five is that conflicts of interest that arise for employees and leaders are overlooked or are left unaddressed. Number six is that the company thinks because they have innovation like no other company, that their company is special and that the rules of business don't apply to them. And number seven is the belief that goodness in some areas atones for the company's evil behavior in others. So the company may be touting what wonderful corporate citizens they are while defrauding investors. Mary Ann Jennings says that if only one of these is present, the situation is still highly fixable. If all seven are present, usually there's no hope.